Our scripture reading for this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 11, verses 19 through 26, and chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word. God, show us how to follow in your path, and he will go and serve you. This is where you need me, I will go. Teach me, Lord, where 
Thank you, Rio. Thank you, Kiki. So when you enter church today, you probably noticed a bunch of dots on the ground and a bunch of names of uh, different, and, and, and perhaps you recognize some of those names as locations, cities, regions in the New Testament. I hope you recognized a few of them, but I guarantee there's a bunch that there's no, no way you recognize because I didn't know them all either. Like they're just, the, but each of those dots represents a place where Paul went on his missionary journeys. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, those on the West Passage were his first missionary journey. On the East Passage, you were following, if you came on the East side, you were following his second missionary journey. Here in the middle, we have the third missionary journey along with his subsequent arrest and his journey to Rome. And, and I say roughly because some of the locations Paul visited multiple times on multiple missionary journeys, and so the dots get a little bit convoluted trying to capture multiple missionary journeys. But there are maps on the walls that you can use to kind of trace what those journeys were, and, and each of these dots represents a place, a real-life place in time and history where the Apostle Paul visited and proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ and either planted or built up churches in those communities. So if you hadn't guessed, that's what we're going to spend the next six weeks uh, as a church talking about, about the missionary journeys and travels of Paul. And there's a couple reasons why we're doing this. First, there's a group from our church, about 30 of us, who are going uh, to Greece and Turkey in a few weeks to travel and visit many of these sites. And so over the summer, I spent uh, a lot of time researching these places so I could better lead uh, the, the group uh, when we go to, to Greece and Turkey, lead them through these sites that we're going to see. But as I was doing the research, I began to think, you know, these are stories that not just a small group of 30 need, but the whole church needs to hear. Because this isn't just, you know, a small group story. This is, a, this is our story. This is the story of how the gospel went from Jerusalem all the way to Rome, how, how it spread throughout the Roman world. And, and, and so and this is the story of the, the challenges it faced and the fruit it bore and what it means to be a church in mission. And that's my hope, that as we go through these stories in the book of Acts, we'll reflect more deeply about what it means for us in our day and time, in our community, in the communities around us, what it means for us to be a church in mission, to have a story to tell and a light to share and good news to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that's what we're going to spend the next six weeks doing. Now, if you came in on either side, you would have noticed that the first dot in the chain was Antioch. Before we can talk about all the places where Paul visited, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about the church where he came from. And let me just, I should have said this earlier, let me pause for a moment and say, uh, there's more dots, there's more places that Paul visited than we have Sundays available to us in this series. We only have six. And so uh, what I did is I, same as we did last year with the Gospel of Matthew and the book of Genesis, I wrote daily devotions that would go along and cover all the spaces in between the stories that we're going to tell on Sunday morning. And so starting tomorrow, you're going to get daily devotions in your email box. And if you follow all of these daily devotions, as well as the scriptural references, you know, that are with each one, you'll read with me uh, through the entire second half of the book of Acts, all of Paul's journeys, everywhere he went, everything he said and did. If you are not sure if you are getting our church emails, uh, like newsletters and things like that, all you have to do is write devotions on your check-in card or when you check in online, make sure we have your email address and, and then check your spam box during the week. But we will send out a message every day covering part of Paul's journey. So back to Antioch. Okay, Antioch was the place 
where Paul began his journeys. And I don't know about you guys, but like for me, I always thought of Antioch as like second fiddle to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the big city, the center of the Christian movement. Antioch, I, I just didn't have any conception of what Antioch was. I thought it was this small little, this small little church. Not at all. So Jerusalem in the first century, historians estimate that it had a population of about 25,000 people. Antioch had a population of 250,000 to maybe 500,000. It was 10 to 20 times larger than Jerusalem. In fact, it was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, only behind Rome and Alexandria and Egypt. It was a huge city, and it was located in the southern, well, the southern tip of modern-day Turkey uh, along the Orontes River, 50 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea. It was a major, it was the capital of Syria, for starters, <clears throat> and it was a major center of commerce and trade. Both the Royal Road and the Silk Road, the Royal Road ran north-south, the Silk Road was a trade route going east-west. Both of them touched base, crossed close to Antioch. So all the goods all the spices, all the produce from the east and from the south flow through Antioch out to the rest of the Roman Empire. It was a place of business. It, 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 because it was a place of commerce and trade, nearly every different ethnicity imaginable in the Roman Empire had a community within Antioch. And that was true of Jews as well. After the Diaspora, a couple centuries before, where the Jewish community scattered following the, the Babylonian exile, one of the largest centers of Hellenistic Judaism took place in Antioch. It was a center for Jews who had left their homeland, and they lived in close proximity to all the different nations, and so they were perhaps a little bit more open to all their Gentile and Greek neighbors. In fact, we know that there were Gentiles who converted to Judaism before they converted to Christianity. We know that because in the Bible, in Acts chapter 6, the Bible tells us about such a person. If you go back to Acts chapter 6, the apostles were choosing seven leaders in the early church to help out the apostles. And look at the last one. It's Philip, Prochorus, I don't even say all these days. But the last one is Nicholas. From where? Antioch. And who was he? A Jew, or a Gentile, who had converted to Judaism. So, given this history, given this makeup of Antioch, we shouldn't be surprised that when in the 11th chapter of Acts, the Jerusalem church decided to embrace God's mission to all the Gentiles, that it would be in Antioch where that church would form and flourish. It would become the first fully integrated church where Jew and Gentile lived in close proximity and worship with one another. Now, the way I read the story, the ministry to the Gentiles in Antioch began before the Jerusalem church ever approved it, perhaps even before Peter's visit to Cornelius. Let's pick up the story, okay? So now we're skipping ahead to Acts chapter 11. So after Stephen was killed, and persecution broke out in Jerusalem. If you remember, the disciples scattered, the early church scattered. But with them, when they scattered, they went telling everyone about Jesus Christ. And it says, you know, those who had scattered, they, they, broke, they went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word initially only among the Jews. But then some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, they went to Antioch and they began preaching to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now, news of this development reached the Jerusalem church, and they wanted to send one of their leaders to go and support this, this booming church, this fledgling church that was growing. And so they selected Barnabas, one of their leaders, Barnabas was known as the son of encouragement. He was a man of, of, of integrity and generosity and, and a leader in the Jerusalem church, so they sent him up there. And when he arrived, and he saw with his own eyes what the grace of God was doing, God was doing something unique and wonderful in Antioch. 
He was glad and he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of Holy Spirit and faith. And under his leadership, a great number of people, more people, came, were brought to the Lord. But before long, the, the growth of that little church in Antioch, it surpassed Barnabas's leadership. He realized, I, 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 this, is, this is more than my capacity. And so he thought, I need a co-laborer. And he went to Tarsus up in Asia Minor, and he sought out Saul, who used to be a persecutor, an enemy of the church. But Barnabas had befriended him had vouchsafed for him before the Jerusalem church, the apostles. And so he knew this Saul guy, he's energetic, he's fiery, he's a great leader, he's a great teacher, and I need men like him to help me. And so he went and sought Saul out, brought him back with him to Antioch. And under their joint leadership, the church continued to grow for a whole year. They co-labored together and the, and the Antioch church was just exploding. So let's look at a few features of this Antioch church. What made it so unique and special? The first thing I would point out is that it was a growing church. Three different times in these short verses, passages that we read, it said a great number of people were brought to the Lord. It was a growing church, which perhaps isn't really all that unique in the book of Acts. Seemingly every church was growing. It was like the Christianity was spreading like wildfire, but it is unique to talk about growing churches in our day and time and culture. In the United States, the church is not doing nearly so well. There was a, a, a major survey done by Lifeway Research in 2019. This is pre-pandemic. And in that time, they found that only 33, about you know, a third, 33% of United, of United States churches were growing. 12% of U.S. churches were holding steady but 55%, more than half of U.S. churches were in decline. And more than half of those churches, the, the 29% of the U.S. churches were in steep decline, losing more than 5% of their membership annually. That's just the whole picture. The United Methodist Church, we struggle even more. In 1968, when the United Methodist Church was formed, we were formed by the joining together of two denominations, the Evangelical United Brethren, and the Methodist Episcopal Church. And when we joined, we were the largest Protestant denomination in our country. We boasted over 11 million members. Now, fast forward, and this is in 2022, so this is even before the global Methodist Church split. We were down to less than half that number. And I'm not just picking on United Methodists. What's happened in our denomination is reflective of what's happened in every mainline denomination. What's happened, churches across the board in the U.S. So Gallup poll in 2020, they do this survey every few years about religious life in the United States, and 2020 revealed, now this has been moving a post-pandemic year, but 2020 revealed for the first time since they began measuring this, going back to the 1940s, for the first time, more people in the U.S. were, were unaffiliated with a church or a congregation or community of faith than those who professed an affiliation. 53% had no connection to a church. First time in our history we crossed that threshold as a country. 50% attended church of those who were surveyed said they attended church weekly as children. Only 20% said they attend weekly as adults. 75% said, oh yeah, yeah, go to the next slide. 75% uh, said religion is losing influence in our culture, in our society today. And then here's the part that kind of broke my heart. 77% of that 53% that said they weren't attending church, 77% said they had no interest in joining or being part of a church in the future. That's a pretty high percentage. And I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer or a Killjoy. I talked about that a few weeks ago. I'm not trying to bring us all down. <clears throat> I think at a base level, at our core, we all want to be part of a vibrant faith community. Don't you feel that? Like, we want to be part of a church that's healthy and growing. And, 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 I, and let me be clear, when I talk about growing churches, I'm not just talking about numbers and numerically. I think there's lots of other ways to recognize growth in church. I'm talking about churches where there's vitality and life 
the movement of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the kingdom. We all want to be part of a church where we sense God is present and lives are being changed and we're making a difference in the world. And Antioch was such a church. So let's talk about a couple other things that were taking place in Antioch that I think were part of the growth they experienced. The second thing you note about the Antioch church is that it was diverse and inclusive. As I said, it was the first fully integrated church, you know, where, where, where Jew and Gentile worshiped and lived together. There's this line in the beginning of Acts chapter 13 that one of those verses that I normally skip right over because it contains a list of names that mean nothing to me, right? So you probably, when Joyce read it a moment ago, you're like, These, those names mean nothing. So let me just review it, okay? So the next slide says, now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. And here they were, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with the Herod of Tetrarch, and Saul, and wah, 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 wah. We don't, you know, like, what does this mean to us? Well, let me show you on a map what this looks like, okay? Let's see where all these people are for. First, we have Barnabas, who was a Jew from Cyprus. Then you have Simeon, called Niger. That called Niger means that he had black skin. He was likely from southern Africa, or at least had heritage from southern Africa. Then you have Lucius, who was from Cyrene, northern Africa, most likely Arabic of descent. And then you have Menaean, who was a childhood friend of Herod the Tetrarch. You know, who's that? That's, that's Herod. Not King Herod from, you know, Herod the Great, that was part of Jesus' birth story when the wise men, but his son, Herod the Tetrarch. This is the Herod who turned over Jesus to Pontius Pilate for punishment. And Menaean grew up with him. They were childhood friends, which tells us that Menaean, his family, was buddy-buddy with royalty. And then you have Saul, a Pharisee from Tarsus up in Asia Minor. Can you picture a leadership team of a church more diverse in ethnicity and geography and socioeconomic status and religious background? They were all over the map, and yet God had brought them together in this place of Antioch, and the church there recognized their gifts, empowered them for leadership. Now, we say this phrase, Almost every week when we open worship, uh, Kim first was the one who coined it. We all said, we like this phrase. She says, welcome to Zion Zillion United Methodist Church, a place where you can find your place in God's story. And that's, I mean, that's what we do. We, we kind of recognize that everyone has a story. And we claim by faith that God is the author of your story. Whatever your story is, God's been the one who's writing it. Every person represents a new story that God is writing in the world. And church is a place where God weaves together our individual stories into the great story of his son. The story of grace and redemption and new life, the story of hope. And, and joy in the kingdom. We're all being woven into this one great story that God is telling. And all this to say is that we believe that every person who comes here, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you're from, what's in your background. Your story matters. Your presence matters. And we hope that this can be a place where you discover your place in God's story. That's why I said earlier, our hope for your presence here today and for your involvement in our church is that you're not just an attendant, that you're not just someone who shows up on Sundays and listens to the sermon. I mean, that's great. We're, not, we're glad you're here, but we hope you take that next step to get involved, to grow, to meet people, to find community and belonging because that's what the church is about, is when our stories get mixed up with each other, and especially mixed up with a great story of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to be.
a diverse and inclusive place where everyone is loved, where everyone is welcomed, where every gift is empowered, and every story is honored. And then one more feature about the Antioch Church. They had a missional heart. They understood at a basic level that they didn't exist just for themselves. It wasn't an exclusive club. They understood that they existed to share the love and grace, the story of Jesus Christ with their neighbor. Let me give you two quick examples of that church in Antioch. First, they had a prophet among us named Agabus who, who predicted that there was going to be a famine that was going to sweep over all of Judea. And sure enough, that famine did happen. But in advance of the famine happening, look what they did. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters who were living in Judea. They would never meet the brothers and sisters of Judea that they were raising money to help, but there was a need that they could meet by the grace of God, and they took up a collection to alleviate suffering in the world. They saw that as a central part of their mission. Now, another second story is the sending of Paul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas, into mission. One time, while they were in worship and prayer together, the Spirit moved among them and told them, whispered in, in their leader's ears, set aside for me Saul and Barnabas for the work that I have for them to do. Now, think about it. Saul and Barnabas were the keys to that to that growth of that church, right? Weren't they the ones who taught, who preached, who built the church from a small thing into this great thing? It would have been natural for the church in Antioch to say, well, hold, hold on, Spirit. Can't you choose someone else among us to send out? Like, we need these guys. But they weren't possessive. <clears throat> they weren't hoarding the capital of leadership they had. They understood that the kingdom of God was bigger and their small church. And so in obedience to the Spirit, they commissioned and blessed and sent out their top leaders to start new churches in the world. And so I want to share with you today that the bishop has called me, and I've been called— actually, no, I'm just joking. Take a deep breath. Uh, <laughs> I thought, man, that'd be like the perfect setup and pitch. Like, you know, like I've been called. No, no. Uh, take a deep breath. Good news is— <clears throat> Neither I nor Kim nor Ashley and none of our pastors are feeling God's call, the Spirit calling us to serve in other communities. That's not what today's about. I do, however, lift up this example to say, look at this church that understood how big God's kingdom was. And to me, this fact that they sent Barnabas and Saul off reflects that they had a mission heart. They were not maintenance-minded. I feel like I've quoted Dr. Peter's story, my seminary professor, a few times lately, but he was the first one I ever heard use these contrasts, what he described as a mission-minded church between a maintenance-minded church. And the way he explained it to us in class, he used this illustration of a, of a bocce ball. He said in some parts of the world, especially in, you know, in South Africa where he was from, bocce balls were weighted on the inside. There was a weight attached to the wall of the ball inside so that when you threw the ball, when, when the ball had a lot of momentum, that, that weight would, centrifugal forces would keep it in the center and it would roll straight as an arrow. But as the ball slowed down, that weight would slide to one side or the other and then it would pull the ball off course and it would curve. And, and skilled bocce players knew how to use that curve to their advantage. Anyways, and he says, so this is what it is to be the church. In every church, there is a weight, and the weight is sin. Because sin is present in every church. We're human. And sometimes we disagree, and sometimes we fail and fight. Sometimes we don't live up to who God has called us to be. There is a weight of sin in the church. But as long as we are moving forward in mission, as long as we have the momentum of the Spirit, that, that, that sin is kept in check, it doesn't pull us off to the side. It's when we slow down, when we, when we turn inward and focus only on ourselves that that, win, that that sin begins to pull us to one side or the other. We, we forget the mission. We forget the call that God has in our lives. We get too focused on ourselves rather than turning out to the world in love and grace. And I've thought about that illustration often, especially over the last few years, as, as I think 
by necessity, we have had to turn inward to really work through some difficult questions and conversations as a church. But by golly, we cannot forget that we exist to serve our community, that we have a mission that is bigger and greater than us, that we are called to love and serve and welcome and include everyone with the love and grace of Jesus Christ. That is our mission. And I'm so thankful for all the ways that this church has continued to practice and will continue to practice the mission, even in the midst of a hard season. Like, I'm so thankful that I serve a church that, that serves the community, that we, we build wheelchair ramps for saws, we build homes through Habitat for Humanity, we provide clothing through Love, Inc., food through the You Feed the Missional Food Pantry, we serve downtown meals at Fletcher Place and, and, uh, and, and Roberts Park, we, 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 we teach immigrant populations English, we run for clean water, we, we support victims of domestic abuse through, uh, through the Coburn Place, and we support at-risk children through Isaiah 7, 117 and the Indiana, Indiana United Methodist Children's Home, and we support development overseas in Guatemala and Haiti, and I'm sure I'm forgetting one or two of our core missions, and I'm sorry if I forgot one of yours, but I can't even begin to encapsulate if I just name programs. That doesn't even capture the daily the thousand acts of love, grace, welcome, hospitality, care that we give to one another and that we give to our neighbors. That's how we share the good news of Jesus Christ. I know earlier I bummed you out with a whole bunch of statistics, but there's a couple good ones in those surveys. Let me share with you two. One, Religious volunteering is the top volunteering type of volunteering in our country, with over a third of those who report as volunteers, they volunteer through their church and through the organization. What does that mean to me? Well, that means the church is still a force for good in our world. The people who give and serve our community, the great number of them do so because of their faith. And secondly, I know there's a lot of worry about the next generation but of the survey that LifeWay Research did, it said that of those uh, Gen Z respondents who weren't involved in a church, who were unchurched, the greatest number of them said 77% would be interested in churches that serve the poor. We want to be a church that matters. We want to be a church that shares the light of Jesus Christ. We love. We serve. We welcome and include and we empower all through the grace of Jesus Christ. This is how we reflect the light of church, the light of Christ to our world. This is how we live into God's kingdom among us. To me, it is so significant that the church in Antioch was the first place where followers of Jesus Christ were given the name Christian. Think about that. This was the name given to them. They didn't call themselves that. Their neighbors, their community saw how they lived, saw that these were people who belonged to and reflected Jesus Christ to the world, and they called them ones of Christ, Christian. What a good name. And this is the name we bear. We are Christians. And I recognize in today's world and society, the church hasn't always done a great job of wearing this name, of bearing this name. There are some people in our world who, who hear Christian and they think judgmental or hypocr uh, hypocritical or whatever. But I remain convinced it's a good name because we serve a good Lord. And what a calling it is for each and every one of us to live up to the name we've been given to share with the world around us the mercy and love and goodness of Jesus Christ. May we strive to be the kind of people, both individually and communally, who by our shared life together share the good news of Jesus Christ with all those around us. Amen? Amen.
Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you that you have called us not just to be individual followers of you, but you have called us together to be the church, to love one another, to serve one another, to bear with one another, to forgive one another, so that in our shared life together, we might offer space for all those who are burdened, who are hurting, who are hungry, those who are looking for support and hope and salvation. Help us, God, to be a lighthouse. Help us, God, in our life as our church to shine the light of Jesus Christ, the hope of the world, to all those who need to see it. We know we don't do this perfect, so forgive us where we fell and encourage us to keep going that we might always pursue with all our hearts and all our being the great calling and the great name that you have given us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.